Woo! I like that. That's good. Good morning, Adventure Family. This message today is just burning inside me. I cannot wait to share this with you. This is, this is from the playlist of the Psalms. And um, I want to ask you a question before we get into this. I just want to ask you, do you remember what you were doing in March of 2020? Does anybody remember? Anybody going, what is she talking about? Anybody? Question? March of 2020, our lives were transformed. They were turned around and not necessarily in the way that we had been praying for, right? But there was a term that was introduced during that time that I'm sure was a common term, and I'm sure that the military guys would would understand this one, but it's the term shelter in place. Guys, remember that? That became part of our vocabulary, as well as social distancing, as well as many other things, but shelter in place. You guys remember that? So this is the definition of shelter in place. An official order issued during an emergency that directs people to stay in the indoor place or building that they already occupy and not to leave unless absolutely necessary. Today we're going to talk about a psalm that's really popular. It's really common. A lot of people pray this over their families. They pray it either first thing in the morning or they pray it at night. And this is talking about sheltering in place with Jesus and the benefits that come and the rewards and the promises that come from sheltering in place. We're also going to talk about war spiritual war. I kind of mentioned something last week. We're going to we're going to kind of dig into that a little bit. We're going to talk about the different attacks that can come against us and how we deal with them and how the Lord defends us as we shelter in place with him. Amen. All right. So, um when I was 5 years old, I remember very vividly that we were at my cousin's house and I grew up in Minnesota. Any Minnesotans out there? Daisy She's ashamed. (laughs) But in Minnesota, there is winter, there are blizzards, and then there is summer, tornadoes. (laughs) So I don't work for Minnesota, as you can tell. I remember this one time in the middle of the summer, we were just playing outside with my cousins, we were having a really good time, and all of a sudden the parents came outside and said, you need to get inside right away. They might have used the term shelter in place, but they said, get in the house. So we went into the basement, because that's what you're supposed to do during tornadoes, and we were in the basement, and there was this huge window, and we literally sat in there, and it was like nighttime. I mean, it got so dark, and all of a sudden, we looked out, and the tornado touched down right in their backyard. They had a huge backyard, so fortunately, it was very far from us. But this tornado touched down before our very eyes. And I remember, you know, as a kid, I wasn't really that that scared. I mean, because I didn't know. The parents, on the other hand, they were freaking out. But the kids were like, wow. I mean, we thought it was great. And that's the attitude Jesus wants us to have in life No matter what comes our way, no matter what tornadoes touch down, Jesus wants us to know that we can shelter in place with him, and he will protect us, he will defend us, he will lead us and guide us. Isn't that good news? You know, uh, Charles, yeah, you can applaud the Lord, that's okay, yeah. (laughs) Charles Haddon Spurgeon, 
the Prince of Preachers, I, I quote him a lot because he has some pretty deep things to say. But this is what he says about Psalm 91, which is where we're going today. In the whole collection of Psalms, there is not one more cheering Psalm. He's saying this is a happy Psalm. Its tone is elevated and sustained throughout. Faith is at its best and it speaks nobly. So first of all, we're going to talk about the attacks. We're going to get into Psalm 91. If you have your mobile device, I'm using the NLT, the New Living Translation. Um, otherwise, it'll be up on the screen for you. Psalm 91, verse 1. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. You know, when you think about the term shadow, you think you can't really be a shadow to someone unless you're very close in proximity, right? We were at a wedding on Thursday, and it was really sunny, and, um, and there was a good husband who stood up in front of his wife to shelter her from the sun. And that's what this is talking about, the covering, the shelter, the place that, that even the shadow of Jesus falls on us through our life. And that comes through dwelling, through making your home with him. It's not, you, you know, your house, even if you travel a lot, your house is the place you go back to, your dwelling place. This is talking about making Jesus your dwelling place. This isn't just like you go to somebody's house and have dinner and hang out for a little while and then go home and, and sleep at home. This is talking about dwelling. I almost wore my bathrobe and my slippers this morning to make the point that dwelling is a place where you're comfortable. It's the place where you can kind of just be yourself. Hopefully that's a good thing. It's a place where you can kind of, as they say, let your hair down. You can just kind of you just, you feel comfortable. I hope you feel comfortable. I know there are situations where, where um, people don't feel comfortable in their own home. But for the most part, our dwelling place, the place where we live, is the place we are most at ease. Yes? Yeah. And that is what Jesus wants to be to us. He wants to be our home, our dwelling place. You know, um, when my kids were little, they liked to build forts. Anybody like to build forts as a kid? You know, with the blankets. And, 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 and the thing is that in that fort, they go, they go down inside and crawl through. Just the other night, I was uh, watching my grandkids, and they wanted to build a fort. Jackson and Sayla wanted to build a fort. So we took these blankets and the pillows and moved the ottoman out, and, you know, and they like to crawl in under it. And that's what Jesus wants it to be like for us, that we're so covered by him, that we're so safe, that there is a covering over us. And that's what he wants. Verse 2 says, this I declare about the Lord, he alone is my refuge. This is talking about the most high God. There's no one above him. There's no other like him. He is the Lord Almighty. He is the Savior and he is the most high God. And it says, he alone is our refuge. You are not going to find refuge in anything except Jesus. You're not going to find refuge in work. You're not going to find refuge in relationships. You're not going to find refuge in having a lot of money or a nice house. Or You're not going to find refuge. What refuge means is a place where you can go to hide. You, it's a place you can go and relax and rest and be at peace. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. Verse three, for he will rescue you from every trap. This is talking about the things that ensnare you. This isn't necessarily talking about a physical trap, but this is talking about a trap, something that entices you and draws you in. You know, you're, you're just kind of going about your day, and then all of a sudden some temptation comes your way, and this is the thing that grabs hold of you and makes you go off course. And it says here, it says, um, he will protect you from the deadly disease. How many like that promise? 
But this is saying, a, a lot of scholars say that this is a messianic psalm, which means it speaks of Jesus. And yes, indeed, it does speak of Jesus. I believe it speaks of Jesus. Not all of it, though, because there are certain parts that don't apply to Jesus, but they do apply to us. They definitely apply to us. But the deadly disease, which is a hellish state, not necessarily just physical. Again, this can also be mental. And how many people know that over the last couple of years, there's been a serious increase in depression, serious increase in anxiety. People are just stressed, right? Can you just take a deep breath? Now exhale. Jesus wants to be that place of safety. Jesus is the most high God. There is this amazing story. There's a, I think it's in the 16th, 15th century, I think. Um, his name is Lord Craven. And he was living in London, and there was a huge plague that came, and he, he was going to leave and go out into the country. So he was packing his bags. And as he was going down the hall one day, he heard one of his servants say, well, I guess he has, to do, he has to leave because his God lives in the country, not in the city. And he, he thought, you know, it was an innocent comment, but all of a sudden he realized that the Holy Spirit was saying, no, you need to stay here. So he started to help the people who were struggling with the plague. And it was killing, it was killing thousands and thousands of people, but he stayed in London, and helped people, and he never contracted the plague. That's what this is talking about. He saw, he saw a sign. Oh, no, wait, that's Haddon. I'm sorry, that's Spurgeon again. Or, yeah, Spurgeon. But verse 4, he will cover you with his feathers. Okay, how many of you know this is symbolic? Jesus doesn't have feathers. <laughs> I mean, unless you read Revelation, and then there's, there's some serious feathers going on. But, but it says, he will shelter you with his wings. You know, in Isaiah 40, it talks about those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount on wings as eagles. And that means like the eagles, the baby eagles that fly under the shelter of their mother's wing. That's what it's saying here. He covers us. He pr protects us. It says his, get this now, please. His Faithful promises are your armor and your protection. His promises are your armor and your protection. Don't be afraid of the terrors of the night. These are the subtle and the hidden falsities or misconceptions or deceptions that come, nor the arrows that flies by day. This is like false ideas that are just blatantly false that we sometimes embrace, we sometimes adopt them. It's saying, don't dread the disease, again, talking about disease, that stalks in the darkness. These are the subtle and the hidden evils that try to be accepted by us. They try to work their way into the fabric of what we believe. And they, they come in to become a way of life. You know, there is an enemy. There is an evil one. His name shall remain nameless. <laughs> he is an evil one. And he is out to get you. He is out to kill you. He's out to destroy you. It says of him, he's come to steal, he's come to kill, and he's come to destroy. And part of the way that he does that is through his lies, through trying to get you to believe things about God that are not true. Deception that God brings. I mean, not God brings, Satan brings. And he wants these things to become a part of our lives. How many of you know that there is evil in the world? You know, I talked to a friend of mine this week. Um, back in 2005, there was a school shooting in Red Lake Reservation in Minnesota. And a friend of mine is a mortician up in Bemidji, Minnesota. And there were 10 victims, including the shooter. And my friend had nine 15-year-olds in his mortuary. And he talked about how devastating it was and how unnecessary and how this evil thing 
had, had completely devastated a community. We're seeing that again. I'd like to just, can we just take a moment and just pray for the morticians that have to deal with this for the families of the victims? Oh, Father, we, we thank you, Lord, that you are good. We thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign. Lord, we know that your word says that it is appointed once for everyone to die. We all have our appointed day. But Lord, we have so many questions. Lord, we, we are devastated by this evil, this evil act. And we thank you that you are the God of comfort. We ask that you would comfort the morticians who have freely offered to do these funerals for free. Protect them, Lord. Protect their families. Protect the families of the victims, Lord. Comfort them, God. Reveal yourself to them, Jesus. Be glorified in their lives. And Lord, we just say again, we trust you. In Jesus' name. Psalm 91.7, it says, Though a thousand fall at your side, though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Now, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that it's true that none of those victims in that school were, were, non, or were Christians. Do you think so? What does this mean? This is saying none of, this, none of these evils will happen to you. Now, how can you justify this, even if this is a messianic psalm? Even if this is talking about Jesus, remember what happened to Jesus? He was crucified. It doesn't seem like it's consistent with what this psalm is saying, does it? But what this psalm is saying is nothing can happen to you. No harm can come your way unless it is allowed by the Lord. I don't believe that the Lord motivates it, but I believe the Lord will use it. In Romans 8, 28, it talks about this. And it's saying, just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. It's saying the wicked will receive their recompense. The wicked are not going to get away with it. We think if God doesn't act right away that he's unjust. We think that God's, he's not doing anything. So obviously God isn't just. That is not true. The wicked, it says in, in Psalm 90, it says the Lord laughs at the wicked because he knows their day is coming. Amen? The wicked will not get away with it. We can't ever believe that God is unjust. God is fully just. And it says here, if, I want you to know, this is a very, 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 very important word. It's the if. The if then. If you make the Lord your refuge. This is saying you don't just go to ATM Jesus when you need something. You know, you don't just show up every once in a while when you're in trouble or, or your life falls apart. This is talking about always dwelling, being with Jesus, making him your life, thinking about him, reading the Bible, praying, being with other believers, meditating on the word of God, sitting in his presence, sitting still before him, listening for his voice. You know, it's, it's not a suggestion that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's not a suggestion. This is a commandment. It's the first and the greatest. It, Jesus basically said none of the other commandments matter except for this one. This is the one. Because if you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will love others. You will honor the Lord. You will want to follow his precepts and his, and his ways, Right? If you really love somebody, you're not going to try to intentionally hurt them. And Jesus is saying, if you want these blessings, make me your dwelling place. Make me your refuge. Don't run to other things. Don't run to alcohol or illicit material on the internet or an affair or work or put your hope in your money or even vacations or, you know, camping or whatever. It's like, don't put your hope in those things. Those things are, well, not all of them are good. Some of them are good. <laughs> work is good. I would recommend working, but don't put your hope in it. It's basically saying, it's saying, 
If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, saying, make yourself at home with Jesus. It's saying, no evil will conquer you. It doesn't say no evil will ever happen to you. It's saying no evil will conquer you and no plague will come near your home. Again, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he, um, during, during the plague, he started to minister to people. He went and, and he was caring for people and he was, he was starting to feel run down and he was exhausted and he started to feel like he was getting sick. But all of a sudden, he read this scripture. Um, I guess there was a shoemaker that had put this up in their window and it said, Though a thousand fall at your side, though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. Verse 11, it says, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They'll hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. After Spurgeon read that, he was so convicted. And he went, I don't have to live in fear. It's saying no plague will come near me. And so he began to to minister to these people and he got healed in the process of it. He was completely fine in the process of it. So now, how many of you remember where another place in the Bible where this scripture is, where it says, He will order his angels to protect you. They'll hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Anybody know what the other reference to that is? Yeah, what is it? Matthew 4. Jesus is in the wilderness. Guess who shows up? Slimeball. Slimeball shows up, and Slimeball thinks, oh, I'm going to get him. I'm going to quote his word back to him. And so he says, He says, hey, Jesus, why don't you go ahead and jump off this cliff? Remember? Remember? He's going to send angels. They're going to protect you. They're going to keep you from hurting yourself. You're not even going to stub your toe. You're going to be fine. This should be evidence to us that even the word of God can be taken out of context. The word of God can be used for uh, false Issues. I mean, basically, Satan was trying to say, hey, let's do a magic trick, Jesus. Let's test this out. And Jesus is like, nope, you will not test the Lord your God. Basically, Jesus is like, do not tempt me. Do not test me. I will not tempt or test the Lord. And so here it says, if you trample on, on lions, we sang about lion, that was the lion of Judah. Okay? That's a different lion. It says here, it says, if you, you will trample on lions and cobras, and you will crush fierce lions and serpents. Anybody remember who the serpent was in the garden? Yep, slime ball. You will, you will crush serpents. Remember, it says you'll crush them with your heel. He has given us that authority. We're going to talk about spiritual battle. Spiritual battle is a real thing, okay? It is a real thing. The problem that most people have is either they, they just deny Satan or they put too much emphasis on him. Not, I mean, not on the sovereignty of God and that God is our protector. So we're going to talk about the spiritual battle. There's different spiritual battles. There can be a self-inflicted spiritual battle. We can open ourselves up to demonic spirits through pharmacia, which is drugs, you know, illegal substances, through what we watch, you know. You can open yourself up letting things into your home, and you can, you can bring a spiritual battle onto yourself. Um, I heard one, one pastor was talking about, you know how if you have two people, you have one person who's a non-Christian, and then you have another person who's a Christian. And let's say they both drink alcohol, They are both going to be under the influence. And in the same way, we can be under the influence of spirits and demonic forces. We need to safeguard ourselves from that. We can be slimed by other people. You know, I believe that, that I know that there have been people that have come in here and tried to curse this church. They've come in specifically with the goal in mind to to bring curses on this church. We can also, um, some of our... 
spiritual battles can be circumstantial. You know, there's a something horrible happens, like say, for example, when my husband passed away, the enemy, he never has mercy on us. He never gives us a day off. He will, as a matter of fact, when you're down, that's when he will try to destroy you. So beware. Be aware. And I'm going to read really quickly. I'm going to go through a bunch of scriptures in the New Testament. Um, Ephesians 6.10, a final word. Be strong where? Be strong where? In the Lord and in his mighty power. It's not saying be strong on your own. Be strong in the Lord as he's your dwelling place. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not, you, you, you need to hear this, especially you married people. <laughs> we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers, principalities, authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. This, this is what the Bible says. This is what we contend against. And you know, sometimes demonic spirits will try to get in to your relationship with your spouse and bring confusion and bring bitterness and bring all kinds of resentment and all kinds of things. Be on your guard because you're not fighting against that person. Sometimes it is a spirit. Luke 10, I love this. This is the most amazing promise. Luke 10, 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you, this is the collective Believers in Jesus, I have given you the authority over all the powers of the enemy. You can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Amen? Crush them. And I love this. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice. We sang this in the very first song. Don't rejoice in this because of these evil spirits obeying you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in the book of life. Your names are registered in heaven. Amen? 2 Corinthians 10.3, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. It says in 1 Peter 5, stay alert. And I say this to you, church, stay alert. Stay alert. Stay alert. You can't let your guard down. It says, watch out for your enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion. This is the other kind of lion. It says, he's looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. How can you stand firm against the schemes of the devil? Anybody have any ideas? How do you stand firm? By dwelling in the shadow of the Almighty. By standing so close to Jesus that his shadow covers you. Being covered by him, that is how you resist the devil. The word of God, you use a word of God. Anytime Satan comes to tempt you or to, to lie to you, speak the word of God. He hates that. He hates that. You know, um, the Christian artist Lecrae says that the reason that we, that we fear is because we fear our circumstances, but we don't fear God. We need to fear the one who is the creator of the universe. Not fear as in like, oh, I'm so scared, but like to recognize who God is. He is the sovereign one. He's the one who allows these things to happen. And this is where, this is how we resist the devil. When those lies come, when something is contrary to God's word, Knowing the Bible, knowing what it says in the Bible, this is called the sword of the spirit because you can chop off the head of the evil one with this. Use the word of God, know the word of God. And if something is contrary to the word of God, it's a lie from the pit of hell. And even Satan used the Bible to try to get Jesus to do a magic trick. Resist the devil, he'll, he'll flee from you. A lot of you have memorized it. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Submitting to God means dwelling with him, means obeying his word. It means honoring him. It means loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This isn't necessarily just like a one-time thing. This is a lifestyle. Live in submission to God, knowing that that is your only place of safety. 
It, um, Pastor Jack Hayford, which he's our great-grandmother, great-grandmother church, um, and he says this. He goes, you can't cast out the flesh, and you can't disciple a demon. There are demonic forces, and you can't reason with them. You need to resist them. You need to kick them out. Um, in the Old Testament, in Leviticus 17.7, um, in Deuteronomy 32, 17, in Psalm 106, 37, there's, it talks about demons. It's even in the Old Testament. And I just want to say, if you're interested and you want to know more about this, we would be happy to send out some resources to you. Just um, If you could just contact us, the connect at theadventure.church, and we'll send you out some good resources on spiritual warfare. Here are seven signs that you might be experiencing spiritual warfare. Overwhelming fear. Depression, suicide, extreme fatigue, unexplained illness, an increased um, bizarre sexual temptation, like not just like your normal temptation, but something really unique, debilitating insecurity that keeps you from, from being able to be relaxed, and critical thoughts, critical thinking. Um, I took part of this list from Dr. Robert Morris from Gateway Church. He does a lot on spiritual warfare. But here's the good news. You ready for some good news? Nudge the person next to you and say, wake up, she's going to tell us some good news. <laughs> these are the promises. Okay, these are the promises. Remember I said, if, then. If you dwell, then these promises apply to you. These are spoken to Yahweh's people not by Yahweh's people. So this is where this psalm takes a little turn. This is the Lord speaking to you. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It says, I will protect those who trust in my name. Trusting in the name of Jesus. Finding yourself in the shadow of Jesus. In the shadow of his wing as you soar with him. It's saying, when they call on me, I love this, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. You know, I read that this week and I was like, oh, Lord, what are you telling me? Are you, are you setting me up? Are you setting me up for some kind of pain? And the Lord said, no, I am with you right now in the trouble that you're experiencing. And that's the thing. He is with us, comforting us covering us, encouraging us, sustaining us. You know, I think, you know, it talks about angels earlier on, and, and the Bible does talk about angels, and it says that they are sent as ministering servants to us, that, that the Lord sends them. They're like a wait staff at a restaurant. You know, Jesus is the executive chef, and he sends the wait staff out. I mean, you don't go crazy with the wait staff and just go, wow, this food is amazing. You really did a good job bringing that out here. Angels are like the wait staff. They, they just serve us. Does that make sense? But God sends them. It says he will command the angels concerning us. And it says, I'll be with them in trouble. I will rescue or deliver them, and I will honor them. I will reward or satisfy them with long life and give them salvation. So here are the blessings again. You ready for the blessings? If... You dwell with Jesus if you're at home with Jesus. If Jesus is your, your roommate, that's how closely, like, you guys are our besties. If Jesus is your bestie, it says he will rescue you, he'll deliver you, he'll cause you to escape, he'll protect you, he will set you on a high place, he will answer you, he'll respond to you, he'll speak to you, he'll talk to you, he'll communicate to you. I'll be with them in trouble, in any kind of afflictions, in distress. You know, sometimes when you're laying in bed, freaking out, stressing out, just begin to speak his name. Speak the name of Jesus. I will deliver him. Again, rescue him. Bring him into safety. I will honor him. I will, I will help him prosper to be strong and to have abundance in the journey. And with long life, I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation. This is saying God will let us see the salvation, which doesn't just mean saving your soul to go to heaven. This means deliverance. This means freedom for you. This means being 
able to see a tornado touchdown and not being afraid. Recognizing that the Holy Spirit has allowed something to come into your life, but he will cover you. He will protect you. Nothing will harm you, Jesus says. You can overcome all the devil's schemes. Isn't that good news? Satan wants you to think that he's smarter than you and he has more power than you. He probably is smarter than you, no offense. He's smarter than me, that's for sure. But he doesn't have power over you. Jesus has given you the authority to overcome all the devil's schemes, but you have to dwell with Jesus. You have to live with Jesus. He needs to be your home. Amen? And then all these promises are yours. Is that good news? Are you guys inspired to make Jesus your dwelling place? Yeah. I'll tell you there's no other way. I've tried a lot of other routes that did not work. I've tried a lot of other paths that are all dead ends. The way, the truth, and the life is Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, I would love to introduce you to him. We're going to stand up, if you wouldn't mind standing, and we are going to offer ourselves to him. I was telling a young man today, you know, it's never a matter of us trying harder. It's a matter of us surrendering more. Jesus is the one. He's the author. He's the perfecter of your faith. Jesus is the one who will walk with you. He will be with you in trouble. He will answer you. He will cover you. He will protect you. And nothing will harm you. Amen? Isn't that great news? So would you, would you lift your hands if you're comfortable just as a sign of, I want to surrender. I want to surrender to you, Lord. Lord, we give ourselves to you. We thank you for these promises, Lord that you will rescue us, that you will protect us, that you will hide us, Lord, in the shadow of your wing. Lord Jesus, that you will set us in a safe place, that you will cover us, Lord, that you will be with us, that you will answer us when we call, Lord, that you will overwhelm us with your presence. Oh, Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you that we can absorb you. Lord, that we can be saturated with your love. Lord, we just bless you and we thank you. And I speak your blessing over this church, over this family. And Lord, I ask God that you would draw each one of us closer to you. Lord, don't let us lose one. Pour out your spirit, Jesus. Pour out your spirit. If you are someone and you have never met Jesus, you can put your hands down. Keep surrendering, though. If you have never met Jesus, you, have ne you, you can't say, I know that I'm born again, because that's, that's the standard. Jesus says in, in John 3, you must be born again to inherit the kingdom of heaven. If you don't know that you're born again, and you want to know Jesus with everybody else, would you respect the privacy? Will you close your eyes? If that's you and you want to know Jesus, can you just slip up your hand as a symbol that you want to get to know him? Yeah. Yeah, amen. Anybody else? On my right? Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Well, Lord, we thank you for your salvation. Lord, we thank you that while we were yet sinners, you died for the ungodly so that we could have new life, so that we could be born again of your spirit. God, let us walk in that this week. Lord, let us not fear. Let us be bold. Let us be strong and courageous and not terrified and not discouraged for you are with us, Lord. We thank you that we can dwell in the shadow of the most high God and we can be safe in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Again, it's a summer of community, transformation, restoration, and relationship. We're going to be doing relationship today as we eat together. Those odd, that are watching online, you're welcome to come over and hang out with us. God bless you guys. I love you. Mm -hmm.